Hello and welcome to the official podcast of Palate Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson, a podcast for those seeking the ultimate in wine, food, and travel. Each week, she interviews winemakers, chefs, celebrities, and a variety of guests that shape the way we enjoy life. Ilana with Palette Exposure um, on this rainy afternoon, sitting down with Russ LeBevan, one of the most dynamic people I've ever met in the wine world. A thinker, a doer, larger than life, extraordinary human being, a pleasure to be around that makes kick-ass wine. Um, he started actually very far away from Napa Valley in the Midwest. Um, I'd like to ask him a few questions about his background, where was he born, where did he go to school, all the good stuff. So let's start there. Okay, um, I am uh, Northern California born and raised and I wish uh, I wish I was as fabulous as you made me out to sound there because well we both know that's not the case but <laughs> um, I was born in Ukiah because my parents couldn't get to Santa Rosa fast enough. Um, everybody else in the family is pretty much Santa Rosa centric. Uh, my great-grandparents are buried there. My nieces and nephews were born there. I consider myself to be a Sonoma County boy. Um, grew up in the, the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Then my parents moved up to Spokane, Washington for my high school years. And that's really when my love of wine began. My best friend, Robert Holcomb, he and I on weekends, we would go and there was a 7-Eleven where the guy knew me and I had a beard and as a sophomore I could buy wine and he and I would go in and we'd both get a, a magnum of whatever we could afford and we didn't drink beer when we got to the party where there was a keg we we drank wine and so legitimately we were beginning wine connoisseurs in our sophomore year of high school and it only blossomed from there in college uh, I worked for Gallo uh, did sales for them in uh, Spokane, Washington when I was at Gonzaga. And then when I got out of college, I was so used to writing that uh, eventually I wrote a wine column through the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And that led me finally to, to moving back home and uh, Cal and Dorothy Shokit giving me a ton of grapes from their vineyard that's about a mile from here or from where we sit right now. And Greg LaFollette mentoring me and teaching me how to make the wine. and. From there, it's snowballed, and goodness gracious, now we're yeah up, up to almost 10,000 cases, and well, life is great. <laughs> Gonzaga University, that's a Jesuit college, right? So your background is quite unusual in that sense. You, you know, I studied business and philosophy, and uh, Gonzaga is a magical place. Um, early on, when Victoria and I weren't weren't really confident as entrepreneurs. She was a dental hygienist and, and I was working in, uh, in sales and uh, the dean of the School of Business called me and invited me to Spokane, Washington for a, a weekend. We spent a weekend with him and a month later he got two of the most successful alumni from Gonzaga, uh, two true entrepreneurs and the three of them cornered us in a, a conference room on a Saturday and we spent a whole day mapping out how to build a business how to finance it and the potential pitfalls and the Gonzaga community embraced us and uh, really allowed Bevan Sellers to become a healthy entity. You know, they, they, they taught us what not to do and literally everything they, they told us and recommended uh, for us to follow has panned out beautifully. So you have really quite a sharp business background, which is not widely known, but I think is imperative and played from what you describe in your pivotal role. Yeah, when when you're a salesman for a long time, you learn a lot about business. And uh, I worked for the Perlman family, and they don't suffer fools. Um, c coming into the wine industry, I came at it as a wine lover. I'm not making wine because I couldn't get into the pharmacology program at Davis and instead did viticulture and enology. I'm making wine because I love wine. Uh, last year I think I spent more money on wine than I did anything else except for maybe taxes. I love <laughs> great wine. I love drinking great wine. Uh, I, I love sharing it and, and making it a, a dream come true. But y you can be artistic when you have enough money to be artistic. 
you have to start a business and be respectful respectful to that business and for the business entity and and it's a mistake there's so many young winemakers make they want to make something that it's esoteric and different and they can make something that's fabulous but it's it's not marketable and you know you have to earn the right to be esoteric you have to be responsible financially to yourself for well, you're never going to be able to do the, the, the fabulous things in life that cost, and so many things cost. You have to earn the right to be esoteric. I just want to highlight it as a teachable moment because clearly the current scene is littered with those that choose to go that direction because they want to be relevant, they want to be famous, they want to be recognized for something. But you talk about foundational things, which is how you began. It... it Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you can look at anything. You have to start with a base. And hard work, dedication, and excellence is a base. Uh, being artistic isn't a base. Wow. That should be on a poster at UC Davis, hopefully, amongst other places. Um, so you formed some very you know, seminal relationships when you first um, started coming to the valley for pleasure, really, to drink wine. Showcats became personal friends, and they kind of gave you your first break. Is that correct? Oh, that that when Victoria and I moved back to California and we were thinking about planting a vineyard, Cal Showcat said, "Look, I'll give you a ton of grapes as long as you promise that you're going to respect it and make it in, in the right way, and you'll get advice on how to do it." And I read all the books, and you, you know that ton of grapes arrived and. We literally had 15 people pull off every grape by hand, and it took us 12 hours. And we divvied them up by plump grapes, soft grapes, dimpled grapes, raisin grapes. And so we had three different fermentations a day later. And within 48 hours, they were so different. It was amazing that they came from the same vineyard. Wow. So you're your own version of Optimus <clears throat> Order. We were absolutely. <laughs> we were 30 eyes. <laughs> looking at every grape. What was it like in the very beginning? Were you terrified? I, uh, I was so excited, I lacked the ability to be terrified. <laughs> I, knew that, uh, I knew that I was working with magical fruit. I was surrounded by Greg LaFollette and uh, Steve Legier from Legier Meredith always took my phone calls and answered my questions. So did Philip Tony, And I knew that I had an amazing support group of very, very bright people. And um, I was just so excited. I was running with my hair on fire. There was nothing that was going to hold us back at that point in time. Wow. So you surrounded yourself with sages, you know, some of the most important, arguably, personalities um, in Napa Valley that were very kind to you and, you know, very forthright with the information. So you were able to gather all this data and process it in your own head and create a vision for what you know, you saw your mission in the wine world. Is that correct? You know, I, I didn't want to mimic any of their styles, mm -hmm. but I respected them all so much. And I knew what I wanted to craft. I wanted to make something that was massive and powerful with refined textures, something that was a little different than what was out there. If you wanted something that was incredibly age-worthy and tannic, there was Dunn, there was uh, Mandavi was going through their revolution, and their wines were very food-friendly and, and 12 and a half to 13 and a half percent alcohol. And I wanted to create something that was truly decadent with power and uh, a purity of fruit. Um, in California, I believe we craft wines that have intensity of fruit and balance better than any place in the world. Uh, if, if you're looking for Bordeaux varietals and you're looking for tertiary flavors, nobody rivals Bordeaux. Uh, if you want to look at some of the powerful wines coming out of Australia, some of the cabs down there are just absolutely over the top and we can't make anything that, that's that monstrous. But if you want a combination of fruit, balance and purity, the Napa Valley does it better than anybody. And, and a lot of people in Napa hate it when I say this, but unfortunately there's so little of Napa Valley that's of that quality. Um, we're sitting here in the middle of Oakville. You, you know, if you go up and down this valley, 15% or so is planted right now. Of that 15%, I would say, and this is just 
totally my guess, but I would say half of it's planted to the wrong rootstock, the wrong varietal, wrong clone of the varietal. Um, the row orientation is right. Uh, of this valley, so little of it is maximized at this point in time. Um, Napa's best days are ahead of her, but we're still just scratching the surface. And that there's a lot in this valley where there's Cabernet grown where it should be Pinot Gris or Sauvignon Blanc because the soils are just too heavy. There, there's places in this valley that, that people want to grow Cabernet, but it should be Syrah or it should be Merlot. And um, we're just figuring all of it out. Ouch. Napa Valley is known as a Cabernet country. It's economic reality, but a lot of viticulturists would probably argue that it's also a viticultural reality. And what you just stated kind of blows that out of the water. Well, okay. We have the perfect climate for Cabernet, but we don't necessarily have the perfect dirt for Cabernet. There's a reason the left bank in Bordeaux has most of the Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, and some Merlot, that the right bank has Merlot and Cabernet Franc. The soils are different. Their climate is very similar. Here, we're much the same. We've got different soil types, and those different soil types aren't always honored. Instead, we put the cash crop on it, not necessarily what should be on it. And that's just the reality of, of Napa. In, in defense of Napa, the farmers and the landowners, um, land here is so incredibly expensive right now, you almost have to plant Cabernet yeah. if you ever want to get a return on your investment. Um, you can spend, I have spent a million dollars on an acre of dirt and I couldn't put Pinot Gris on that and never make a dime. I mean, I'll, I'll struggle to make, uh, make money on it with Cabernet Sauvignon, but when Victoria and I bought the Saunders property, we were spending a million dollars an acre for the dirt that was planted in the available acreage it was left to be planted. And the, the economics are such that we had to. And it's not different for somebody buying dirt in, in the valley floor in Oakville. Um, should it be planted to Pinot Gris? Absolutely. If you plant it to Pinot Gris, are you gonna disrespect your business and potentially fail? Absolutely. So you have to plant it to Cabernet Sauvignon. The challenge then is to farm it at a world-class level to make sure you're at least optimizing what you're getting from that site. The dirt might not be right, but the climate's right, the airflow's right. So are you then going to, knowing you've got heavier soils, rip all the leaves off of the fruit zone, denude early enough? Are you gonna plant cover crops that are heavy that are gonna suck vigor out of the soil? And when I talk about pulling all those leaves, if you pull all the leaves early to get the sun exposure to the grapes, you can cook out some of those green flavors that are so prevalent in heavy soils. Get rid of the pyrazines because you need UV penetration into a grape to get rid of those qualities. And so if, if you're going to plant in the wrong area, you then have to farm at an amazingly high level. And I don't think most of those people are doing that. So you recognize widely as a rock star winemaker uh, that garnered so it, many accolades. It, in, in my own mind, but... Oh, no, I, I, would, I would argue that point. <clears throat> I think people really see you as one of the top, top-notch winemakers in the Valley, uh, but you're also an obsessive viticulturalist, that, as evident from your last comment. Um, you're really a vineyardist at heart, aren't you? Well, you have to be. Um, uh, an amazing winemaker is somebody who respects what came to them from the vineyard. The rock star is the site, mother nature, and the vintage. Um, once you get it, uh, your moral obligation is to protect it and, and craft excellence. So I tell everybody, all of the sites we work with, I know they're going to give me fabulous flavors and fabulous aromatics. As the winemaker, my responsibility is to manage the textures and the balance of the wine. Eventually, the vineyard's voice will speak. I need to make sure that my winery is immaculately clean. You can eat off of my floors. You can drink water that's flowing down my drains. I want to make sure my winery is clean so the wines require less sulfur. I don't have to rack as often. I can keep my wines safe and secure in barrel. Um, our, our job is to make sure that everything is as clean as possible. Andre Telechev, you clean and you scrub until you can't clean and scrub no more. And then your winemaking from there, 
we try to be as non-interventionalist as possible. Just leave the wine alone, respect it, make sure it's not getting reductive and you're not getting off aromatics. Use expensive oak barrels. We actually now spend more on oak to get less impact. Several of our cooperages, we're spending an extra 100 to $150 per barrel for extra stave mill aging. So they actually will rotate the wood through the stave mill a couple more times. And that sucks flavor and tannin out of it, which is counterintuitive. Most people want more oak impact from their barrels. We want less oak impact for our barrels because we're using 100% new oak. Because I want the last thing to touch the inside of the barrel before my wine to be fire. I want a new barrel for every wine and I want less oak flavor and less oak texture. I just want that clean vessel so I know my wine is safe. So we're spending more to get less and we're scrubbing more so we don't have to do as much. And a great winemaker is cleanly. He does whatever it takes to protect that juice and he knows that his obligation is to just magnify and make sure the wine is balanced because the vineyard has already done the heavy work. What is the most challenging part of your job? Um, most of the people around you would tell you it's trying to live with my own ego. <laughs> um, uh, the, the business portion tends to be the most difficult. Yeah. Um, working with the bank, making sure sales are where they need to be. Um, we've grown Bevan Cellars so fast yeah. and we have no business partners. We have uh, Silicon Valley Bank is our, our only partner, but you know, the wine industry is tough. You can't write off your costs of goods sold until you sell the wine. So if you grow through cash flow, you're not collecting any of that money until you sell the wine. So your tax bill can be huge because it looks like you had a huge year, but if you grew, you have no money left. So there, there's been times when we, we borrowed money from family members to cover payroll, even though we had a banner year and our tax bill was absolutely huge because you, you can't capture those funds until you sell the wine. So just making sure that the cash flow is there has been, been a, a, a huge obstacle. Uh, obstacle. Fortunately, our wines sell well. We make a style that I think people appreciate, but it's, uh, it's always a struggle making sure the business side is, is all together. Would you do anything differently if you were to go back in time and, you know, 20 years, let's say, and change anything that you've done? You know, not, not much. It's been a fairy tale. Um, you know, we started out with nothing. Uh, Victoria was a dental hygienist. She retired in 2012. I stopped uh, selling dental products in the end of 2012. Uh, that was just seven years ago. The winery has been in place since 2005. Uh, we, we, we struggled and scrapped and saved and you know we had a couple customers who made their friends buy a bunch of wine or we wouldn't have been in business. Um, that there was a time when we had seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in credit card debt. Um, we were we would get checks from a credit card company, and and pray to God that they would actually clear because we were transferring from one card to another card, and uh, it, it was incredibly incredibly lean. But it's all taken us here to this point, and you, you, you know. I'm not saying we're comfortable now, but we were able to buy that Saunders property at a million dollars an acre. And granted, it was all financed through Silicon Valley Bank, but the business was healthy enough for the, that they would give us that loan. And um, we're now in a spot where we, we, we know we can breathe at night. And, and yeah, the, the, the dreams kind of come true. How do you maintain such balance? Because it's an extraordinary feat. So. There's no balance. <laughs> I mean, marketing, which is what a lot of small businesses fail at because their bandwidth is not there between production and market. Yeah. You know, we've never spent money on an ad. The only money we've ever spent on marketing were, were as business cards. Um, we've been blessed that... Um, you know, Wine Spectator did a, a long feature piece on us. We've gotten good reviews. People have found us, and so we've been fortunate. Uh, we're also very lucky early on, Total Wine & More uh, uh, agreed to buy a big percentage of our production, and 
uh, we still sell that same percentage to them and they guaranteed that they'd buy X amount and it covered our growers and, and that gave us a, a big peace of mind. Um, they've always been a fabulous business partner for us and uh, we, we, we've been lucky that we haven't had to do a lot of marketing. Let's talk about the luck factor because there's a reason why Total Wine got behind your product. There's a reason you got fabulous press. There's plenty of wineries making good wine in that valley. Your wine had this edge that people just couldn't deny. And it's rooted in your philosophy. You touched upon it earlier and I believe some of it at purely hedonic qualities. You have that value. Well, you know, I'm, I'm blessed that I make what I like to drink and I, I, I have drank the, my own bloody Kool-Aid, but I, I like wines that are romantic and seductive. And we make wines that are romantic and seductive. And we've actually tracked our customers and our average customer is buying more now than they used to. Wow. We, we, we don't have a lot more customers than we did three years ago, but people are increasing the number of bottles they're buying because they kind of like that same style and and I'd much rather have people buy our wines and drink them than collect them and I know our wines are incredibly age worthy you look at the colors of the wines the the anthocyanins in and, and when I run a tannin assay to look at the total phenolic numbers and I do a dry extract test to see how big our wines are our wines are huge but they're huge and, and powerful but they don't have hard edges and people seem to respond to that style. And to make the wines the way we do is a lot of work and you have to pay a lot of attention. And as Greg LaFollette always says, you know, you're, you're at the precipice and you need to, to look and be able to pull it back when it starts to hit. And we, we do so much hands-on stuff during fermentation and during pressing. So hopefully we don't have to do it after, but it requires you tasting and smelling a lot. I'll taste every fermentation multiple times a day when it's getting ready to be pressed so I can determine when to press it. We don't do anything on a number. Everything is based on palate or aromatics. So you must have incredibly powerful instincts. You validated, as you described so eloquently, with various analyses and data points, but something within you guides you, doesn't it? He you know, I'm blessed that I don't have much of a conscience, so I can I can make a decision and not look back, and I have conviction in my uh, in my decision making process. But at this point in time, I'm very comfortable deciding when to press, when to stop doing pump overs and start using the pulsar equipment that we purchased, and and how to incorporate all of those things and and. Yeah, you, you, being a winemaker isn't for somebody who can't be decisive. If you second guess yourself and you're indecisive, you'll you'll absolutely fall apart. Has it always been the case? So did it become somewhat evolutionary as a result of gaining more experience over the years? Uh, I've, I've never had a conscience, so I've always been <laughs> pretty, pretty good at making a decision. Um, but I, I, I certainly now am much more confident when I make a decision, especially in the winery, if, if it's time to press or, or it's time to stop pressing and when to do those things. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at a point now where I'm confident in those decisions. What I'm not always confident about at this point in time is, well, heck, we're, we're going into this vintage and I'm already getting extremely concerned about 2019. Uh, we've had more than twice the amount of rainfall this year. Uh, it's cold the next two weeks and, and we're already towards the end of March. Uh, where we normally already have bud break, we just have swell. We're a couple of weeks away from bud break. So it's already looking like a late vintage. And, and granted, that can change but there's so much water in the ground as well. So, you know, luckily we've planted cover crops, but with this much water, you could potentially have big berries and thin skins. The vines are gonna be predisposed to, to not working on grape flavors because they're so healthy. Instead, they're gonna work on their root systems and work on more canopies so it can have more photosynthesis. And it, it, it's gonna be a year where the vines don't feel stressed. So right now we're gonna to have to start working to artificially stress them 
but right now that's scaring the death out of me. So you really look at the vintage very early on, way before even the flowering occurs. That's when you start worrying. Or oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I like to pretend that I'm cool and I don't worry. I worry about vintages, the vintage before, because when you go through set in 2018, you're determining your crop for 2019. Yeah. So that's when all of that's happening. So, you know, the last couple of years, the, the weather has been absolutely perfect during sets. We've had fabulous crops. 2018 is a legendary vintage. We had good yields. We had great flavors. I mean, ju just an epic vintage. This vintage is starting off really behind the eight ball. I've told everybody, if you disc or spade a vineyard, I will shoot you. You can mow and we'll mow every road to, to make sure the grasses keep, keep growing. Mm -hmm. But we need these grasses to pull as much energy and vigor out of the, the vineyards as humanly possible. We need global warming to get its act together and, <laughs> and warm things up in a hurry. Wow. So the misconception in the wine world, of course, driven by romance, is that it happens you know, during harvest and in the cellar. But that's a complete fallacy. Uh, it, 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 it's done, well, this is a huge conversation, but <laughs> it, it's, it's done when you pick the piece of dirt. So, okay, let's take Saunders for an example. We, we're just about to develop a couple of blocks. Yeah. So we purchased the dirt up there because it's red dirt and the red soils in Oakville that are iron based are just legendary. So you start there, then you have to look at your topography and all of these are on hillsides at different angles. So you then have to decide, okay, what's going to be the best way to maximize this block? What's my right row orientation? Because we know we want a southwestern orientation to get the sun over the top of the canopy at the heat of the day. So you know you want some sort of row orientation like that. If it goes another direction, so you can maximize the length of the rows or the number of plants, then you're then making a compromise on that. Then you have to change the farming approaches. So you start in, okay, you got your dirt, then you get your row orientation. Then you've got to get your spacing. Some sites need tighter spacing to promote competition. Some needs more space because you're all on rocks. So you've got to get that decision right. Then you've got the rootstock. With a grapevine, you have the, the type of plant it is, Cabernet Sauvignon, on the top half, let's say. And then you have a root system down below. And there's so many different rootstocks out there. So you have to pick, pick your site then pick your varietal, then that varietal has to match the rootstock and you got to pick the rootstock to match the dirt and your water needs. So those things have to all be in place. Then you've got your row orientation. Then you've got your watering decisions and, and everything else. And, and that's just to get the, the site right. Then how do you manage the canopy in a vintage that's a challenging vintage or a hot vintage? So you've got to look at that. We've got a bunch of vineyards this year, like Sentinel Ridge up on Hell Mountain, where we left kicker canes, which are canes that we're just going to let grow and grow and grow, that we're then going to clip off later in the year just to suck vigor out to stress the vines. Um, we're already looking at, okay, we've got all of this water. What are we going to do to, to, to manage that? We're going to allow suckers, the vines that grow off of the vine from the bottom, to grow as long as they want and we're going to pull leaves off of those so they will be an energy suck so that there's a big piece of yeah creating the excellence is finding the site developing the site properly then managing that canopy correct for the vintage and not being somebody who just does it the same way every year because that's how you get huge vintage variation I want to have consistent excellence. I don't want to have four home runs out of a decade. I don't want to have three doubles in, in good wines and then have three spotty ones. I want to have excellence or close to it every year. And that requires every piece of that puzzle being, being respected from day one. What you're describing is anything but formulaic. How do you arrive to all of those m multitude of conclusions that you have to make along the way to get it right? you have to pre-plan. Uh, success is never an accident. You need to have a roadmap. And if you don't surround yourself by other smart people and bounce all of your ideas off and make sure that, that you're doing it the right way, you're, you're, you're toast. You can pull it off for a while, but 
to, to reproduce it time and time again, you, you, you need to have a, a fabulous team around you and uh, then never take the, the gas pedal off. And everybody needs to know that their, their job is at stake. They, they can't take a, a, a break. You know, when you're in a, a football team, the 49ers under Bill Walsh, every player, including Joe Montana and Jerry Rice, knew that their job was on the line. Their name didn't mean they were going to be the superstar. With, with our winemaking team and everybody here, it's the same thing. Everybody knows if, oh, you, you know, you're, you're not on your A game, you're gone because our price point at 195 bucks a bottle, that's a lot of money for somebody to spend on a bottle of wine. The conclusion of this interview can be found in the next podcast already available for your download. Thanks again for tuning in to the official podcast of Pal Exposure featuring Ilona Thompson. 